can be present and kind as we do great things. I'm John Losey, I'm your guide for our little expedition here. And today we have Mike Brennan. I met Mike at a conference called The Thing last spring. And I loved what he was doing. I got a chance to look over his shoulder and what he does or what he did there is he was sketching and drawing these amazing uh, uh, pictures or, or drawings of the presenters and also pulling out key words. And for me, I, I, I love the visual stuff. And he was making connecting the visual to important points. I come to find out that Mike is also, uh, I mean, not only just a talented artist uh, and makes his living at that, but he also helps other creatives figure out how to make that part of their everyday lives. He also has a background working in graphic arts for other organizations, but also working in the church setting, helping bring uh, visual power to the churches. So I'm excited to talk about my, talk to Mike about a lot of different things today. Welcome, Mike. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it. So a couple of things like, uh, how did you start doing the, uh, the live sketching at, at events? How did that come about? Yeah, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> I have a, a running theme in my life where I stumble into things by accident. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you, the things that you plan don't pan out so much. Uh, and then other things pop up and you're just like, okay, I think I'm going to run with that. Uh, it was something that honestly happened organically. I found myself at some conferences and obviously, you know, with being an artist, just love to draw, love to, you know, I wasn't necessarily doodling per se, but while some speakers were on stage and stuff and while some things were happening, I found it just, um, you know, sometimes just good for me to capture for my own sake, uh, little snapshots of what was happening during an event. And so I started just doing these digital illustrations, really, again, just for my own sake. Um, and then eventually I would be sharing them on social media or something, or someone would see them and people would be like, Hey, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, um, and just really asking me more questions about it and just kind of probing a little bit deeper. And honestly, it wasn't until maybe about um, four or five years ago that I was at a conference and there was, I was doing that, you know, kind of sending out on social media, people are looking at all the stuff. And uh, I had kind of a one-on-one -on -one 15 minute power session with somebody who was at this conference kind of offering their time for free to kind of help people drill down on some of their passions and some of uh, business things that they need some help with. Um, you know, again, clarity, uh, really. So I met with this individual um, and he, you know, was talking to me about the different things that I was doing. And he identified this that I was doing at the conference and said, you know, this is actually something that people would pay for. This is a service you could offer. And, you know, there's value here. And for me, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, this is just something I do. Like it hadn't really dawned on me to, to consider this as a service to offer in a business context. Um, again, because it was really just for me capturing moments that I wanted to remember more vividly, especially. And so um, after that conversation, I really started leaning into that and thinking, okay, so how can I firm this up a little bit more? How can I lean into this so that I put some more practical things around it and offer it in different packages and say, hey, if you have a, uh, an event, you're an event planner, <clears throat> you're, you're a promoter, and you have an event you want to, uh, to have me come to, to capture this in real live time. So basically what, what happens is really, I'm storytelling, right? I'm telling the story visually of what happens during an event from the speakers on stage to uh, maybe special events that are happening off in the corner. You know, if there's uh, some kind of, you know, water balloon fight, I don't know, you know, some other thing to kind of uh, crowd pleaser. I like the conferences you go to. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I noticed in this was that, so I've been to a lot of conferences <laughs> where they have sketch noters up yes. inside the stage, sketching those things out. And those aren't so much telling the well. I guess they're telling the story of the information that's being put up on the stage. I right. got, when I looked at yours, it was a little bit different. Uh, you were doing something a little bit different than the sketch noting thing. What, yes. You know, yes. Why are you trying to do this different. And that's, that's a, actually part of my needing to educate some people when they want to find out more about what it is that I do in this context, because automatically some people lump me in that category. And those people are usually referred to as graphic recorders and they're, 
goal really is to distill down somebody's message into a visual format. And usually it's kind of almost like a mind mapping with icons and key phrases and such. That's not my goal. My goal is to create a piece of art that's a snapshot of a moment that will also call out a quote that somebody said something, you know, specific or, you know, something about that moment that struck me as part of the people who were in the audience. And so, you know, it, it's a very different type of thing. So mine is really looking more, again, snapshot out of time, storytelling, so that when you put together all these illustrations that I'm doing during a conference, these sketches, it tells the complete story in real time. And a lot of times I'm sending these out on social media as I'm creating them as well so that people who are there at the event can be following along and being like, oh yeah, you know, I remember when so-and-so said that, or, or I remember when this happened at the conference and there's a little bit of a buzz that happens. And for those people who can't make the event, it's telling them the story also and saying, hey, here's some of the things that you're missing out on. Um, and so it's a great way to have ongoing real-time marketing images. And um, even I figured out a way to package some things up afterwards when the conference is over so that people can kind of have a little keepsake and you know, that's more than just notes that they jotted down in the conference notebook that everybody knows we stash those someplace and never open them again, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and there's, I can't remember if it was uh, Henry Nowen or Thomas Merton, uh, somebody like that said that which is most personal is most universal. So when you mm -hmm. pull a quote out, usually it's something that struck you but also if it strikes if it strikes you it probably strikes a lot of people right yeah yeah and that's what i found you know sometimes it's difficult because i'm obviously trying to take in all this visual information i'm creating the sketch you know and trying to do it during this person's message so i'm creating but i'm also trying to actively listen which sometimes can be a little bit challenging and there have been times where i'll jot something down that somebody says as they're saying it stash it on the side <laughs> and then as i'm continuing my illustration i may change what that quote is because i hear them say something else and i'm like oh wait no that's the thing actually that i want to put out there um so it's very organic uh it's very quick and in the moment um but i think that's part of the charm of it that it's not this kind of calculated thing um it doesn't feel kind of i don't know uh stale if you will yeah, my feeling when I look at your your art, at least the art that I've seen of yours, is that it is spontaneous. It doesn't look like it's been overly refined. And so that makes it, to me, feel more organic and authentic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, if, and if anybody wants to see more examples of this kind of stuff, uh, you can actually go to uh, eventsketches.com. And that's uh, a page on my website that has a whole bunch of examples from past uh, conferences and events that I've been to, as well as if anybody happens to be hosting an event and they would love to have me come in, they can reach out to me there as well. Yeah, so I'm going to put it up here on the screen. This is Mike's website and he's got, this is uh, some of the event sketches that he's done. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, he's also got, and this is what, uh, um, uh, some of the other stuff, and I, just in preparing for this interview, I went and I was clicking around, love the pet sketches. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are a lot of fun. I also was uh, you know, really impressed in how the, the yoga uh, portraits, mm -hmm. um, because I mean, it's di to me, it's difficult to capture. I'm not a yoga guy, but I appreciate how difficult it is. And I think you get the, the, the in your sketches, you get the challenge, uh, but also the beauty of the poses. Mm. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I want to ask you a question about, you know, you mentioned uh, in other places that uh, you always wanted to be a cartoon character when you were a kid. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm curious about what cartoon character you wanted to be. Uh, I, it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to be somebody else. It wasn't like I wanted to be Bugs Bunny or Woody Woodpecker or, you know, Tom and Jerry. Um, it was really more that I myself wanted to be a cartoon character um, as myself, <laughs> you know, what, I wanted to enter that world pretty much. What about it? What about being a cartoon character drew you in? What was it? The, the, was it the, the visual medium? Was it the ability to defy gravity and fall down after an anvil like <laughs> Roadrunner? No, um, not so much that stuff. I think, 
you know, it's just associated with some of my earliest memories. Uh, you know, Saturday morning cartoons, you know, may they rest in peace. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, that was, that was a huge part of my world. And um, I, I, as I look back, right, you know, you have this perspective, the older you get, you look back on your childhood and you think, okay, at the time I didn't realize that this is what was happening, but I think I was just being drawn to the stories and the characters and the worlds that these characters lived in. And, you know, it would vary depending upon the show that I was watching, but it, it, it drew me in and it helped me uh, form imagination. It helped me figure out that there's a story going on that I was interested in and characters' lives that I was interested in knowing these characters more and in somehow interacting with them. And so obviously as a kid sitting in front of a TV, you're not really interacting, uh, you're watching. But I figured out, okay, I like these characters, maybe I'm gonna start to learn how to draw them. And so that was the next step for me was, how do I take these characters that I love and these stories and things that are happening and start to make it a little bit more of my own world? Yeah, so so you, you've mentioned um, in conjunction story and art several yeah. times, even just in the short conversation. Why is story so important? Wow. Um, story is important because I think that is such a key way for us to communicate. Um, whether it's information, whether it's experiences, uh, sharing life, Story is the vehicle so many times that allows us access to another person. You know, you can come and give some facts and figures. You can come and present data. Um, I'm not a data guy. I'll just be very upfront with that. Obviously, as an artist, <laughs> it's very unusual. But, um, you know, but if you take that information and you package it in a story, it will be received and remembered and, and accepted. And stories have a way of living on beyond the person who's even sharing it and they get spread. You know, you think about um, so many things from history, so many great uh, speeches, so many uh, historical figures, you know, there were stories that were surrounding these people and these events. And so that's what has kept them alive even long after those people have passed on. Yeah, the stories that we tell are, are what define our culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When I work with the business leaders, I try and get them to tell stories uh, along. They have to have really good data. Data convinces, but, but really emotions and story moves people to action. And this is what's, what's interesting to me is, is I believe, and data, again, we'll get into data, but two-thirds of your brain is dedicated to visual processing. And even stories, because stories are picture, are, are word pictures. And so you will process, yeah, you'll hear the story, or in your case, you see the story, but it's processed visually. And so when you tell a story, when you, you connect to the emotions, and that moves people to action. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I want to hear, I, 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 Definitely want to pick your brain more about stories, but I want to get to some other stuff as well. Sure. Um, tell me about the Starbucks cup. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Starbucks cup is part of my journey. And I'm not talking about uh, necessarily my morning cup of coffee, uh, although that is <laughs> a very important part of my day. Um, I had taken a 10-year absence from making any art. And part of that was uh, my own journey kind of going off in different directions. And um, I found myself at a place where 10 years had gone by. I was suffering from depression. Um, I hadn't really done much creatively. I was, it was in some roles that were not really suited for me, more administrative type things. Um, I had handed over the reins of some more things creatively to some younger people who were coming up in an organization. Um, and so I found myself in this weird place and, and again, started suffering from depression, wasn't even really aware of it in the beginning until some people came around me and said, you know, Hey, I think you're depressed. Uh, and I had to kind of wrestle with that and figure out like, why well, am I, is that really what this is? Um, so 
that led me on a road that was uh, just very dark and a very um, difficult time in my life where there was uh, a stripping away of things. You know, I had to leave the career I was in. Uh, we had to move, um, leave a faith community, um, family, friends, so many things being stripped away. And, and just to interrupt your story just for a second. I think it's so important that you're talking about this because um, in our culture and especially in the church, uh, it's almost, it's taboo to talk about being depressed. You're not allowed to have uh, any mental challenges, any kind of psychology is frowned upon. And I'm so glad that you're talking about um, a horrible time. Depression sneaks up on you, like you said. But I, I appreciate you talking about it and, and talking about uh, how you move through it. Yeah, well, and, and just as a little aside, the, the position that I was with was in at that point was inside the church. And so that compounded things even more because here I was in a place of leadership. People are looking to me to lead them and to care for them. And I was struggling myself going, you know, I can't, I can't keep it together myself. I can't, you know, find my way through this depression. Uh, the visual story for myself and my brain was like, I had this knotted up ball of twine and I was trying to find the edge of it to figure out, okay, what's the problem? How do I solve this? How do we get around this? Um, but I couldn't find the edges. I couldn't find where this twine began or ended. And so it just remained in this knotted up ball of twine for a long time um, until, you know, seeking some counseling and some help. And like I said, unfortunately, you know, it was, it meant for me moving out of that position. It meant moving out of um, everything that I knew and was holding on to. There was the stripping away period and then, you know, found myself going, okay, we're going to start again. And what does that look like? How do we do that? And now as part of that, I was trying to just show up every day because I was like, okay, do I have enough strength to show up for today and do what I need to do? Okay, probably. Yeah, just today. And so I took it just one day at a time. I mean, you know, we, we throw that phrase around a lot, but this was literal one day at a time showing up, you know, writing in a journal, praying, asking God, seeking God, like, how do I move forward? What is what does life look like that now? Um, what do you want my life to look like now? Where should I be? What should I be doing? A lot of the deeper questions, when you get rattled to the core, um, you start just reevaluating things. And especially when, like I said, you have a lot of things stripped away, there's a sense of desperation. There's a sense of um, needing this Phoenix moment where you're rising from the ashes, you know? And so I was, I was wrestling my way through all that. And it was during that time that I felt God speaking to me and saying, hey, I want you to return to your personal art. And this was kind of a weird thought for me because I'm like, what does that have to do with all the stuff that I'm going through right now? And, and also, can I create? Like, I've had a 10-year absence and how am I supposed to engage with this part of me again? Is it still alive? Or can I resurrect it? Or you know, what does this look like? And so again, it was just, can, can we show up today? And so what happened is I, I ended up um, reading a book that was encouraging me to um, do just even a, a five or 10 minute sketch a day. And so I said, well, I guess I could do that. And so my day one, I decided I would show up at this Starbucks, you know, and get a coffee cup and I set it on the side and I opened up a brand new sketchbook and I'm like, okay, how do I do this? you know, there's no muscle memory right now, <laughs> you know, I mean, it had been a long time. Um, but I took my pen and put it on the page and started to sketch the Starbucks coffee cup. And it was the most awkward and awful drawing I had done, you know, in a really long time, I was embarrassed by it. Um, because the skill level wasn't there. It just looked visually awkward. I felt awkward. I didn't want anybody to see it. Like I wanted to just close my sketchbook and like throw it away. That's got to be tough for somebody who's who's trained and you know you yes. went to college for all this kind of stuff, and to see kind of the gap between what you know you're, what you used to be capable of and what produced. Man, that's yeah. got to be tough. Yes. So I said, okay, well, this is day one. I dated it and put day one closed the book and said, okay, I'm going to get up tomorrow and do something new. And so I came to love that drawing and hate it 
I hated it because, you know, it was embarrassing, not technically correct. And all those reasons I just said, but I loved it because it was my day one. It was a new beginning. And I didn't know it at the time, but that led me on a daily art making journey that continues to this day, which is now almost seven and a half years later, every single day doing a drawing or painting. That's and, great. Um, you know, that, that was key. That was a key moment. How, I know that you hated that drawing, but how important was it for you to be able to start poorly and start with a bad drawing? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was way, yeah. I mean, you, you can't, you just have to show up and do what you can do and allow yourself, like if you're first learning something, you're not going to be excellent out of the gate. You can't, you got to get rid of that expectation because you will cripple yourself and you will not be able to move forward. You, your perfectionist tendencies, you know, some people have more than others, but they will, they will stifle it. So you need to kind of figure out how to put all that aside and say, you know what, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do this thing. And that's why I said it was like five or 10 minutes. I knew that this wasn't going to be a masterpiece. I knew that it was just going to be an exercise for me. And it was really more about me developing a daily creative habit than it was about what it was that I was actually producing. And I also knew that I had to make a lot of really bad art before I started making good art again. Yeah. Um, and so it reminds me of a, a I'll, I'll throw out a mutual friend, uh, Craig McNair Wilson. Yes. Who, uh, I learned the phrase from him. Anything worth doing is worth doing well, but anything worth starting is worth starting poorly. Yes. Uh, I, I, I butchered that into uh, uh, you've got to be willing to suck in order to get good. Absolutely. Yeah. So now in this, this, this daily journey, I, I love that you talk about habit and I posted a little while ago. Uh, uh, I did a, a podcast on uh, why inspiration is for amateurs and I appreciated your response to it because I don't know if you remember that, but what you said, you agree with the sentiment, but you just don't like the phrasing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think because, well, you know, habit is important, right? Like I just said. And um, as a matter of fact, the thing that I discovered, one of the key principles that I talk about when I come alongside other people and try and help them on their journey is, you know, habits create momentum and momentum brings change right? So if you want to see change in a certain area of your life, develop a new habit. It's not about, you know, flirting with your art in, you know, well, I do this for a day or two and then I don't touch it for another month or another two months, you know, or whatever it is that you're trying to create. Um, it's about engaging with it. And again, in the beginning, it's more about creating the habit than it is about the actual art. Now, in terms of, of inspiration, um, I think inspiration is important because you, if you don't feel inspired, you're not going to have that spark, that idea, that passion behind the habit and the drive to do. Um, so that I think they kind of go hand in hand. You know, you need to have a system set up so that you're showing up and you're doing the work and you're, you're leveraging that habit and momentum, but then you're allowing uh, inspiration to come in and fill the sails, if you will, and propel you forward so that what you're doing is exciting for you. It becomes exciting for others. Um, if you are inspired by somebody else's art or somebody else's life in some way, and you take a piece of that and you say, I want to create, you know, some art around that, you know, like, like we said before, you, even when I'm doing these, these sketches for speakers, they're saying something that's inspiring. And I'm capturing that, their words, and I'm now crafting this, this illustration, this sketch around it to, to remember the moment and mark it and have it so that I can look back on it. Um, and so I think, again, they go hand in hand. Um, and I'm not somebody who subscribes to, well, you have to wait for the muse um, because I don't think that that is correct. There are plenty of times when I have not felt inspired. I have not... Uh, had any great ideas that were just looking to come out of me. But I said, okay, I have set this time aside. I'm going to leverage my habit and my, you know, my scheduled time to show up and I'm going to see what happens. And if I push through and I create something and it falls flat, 
okay, tomorrow's a new day. Are you ever, do you ever find yourself practicing the habit and finding yourself inspired? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sometimes the feelings follow. Um, because especially if you learn to build in experimentation and play, which I think are very important factors in creativity. And if you're going to break any new ground, if you're going to push through routines and your go-tos for creativity, you need those places where you can play. You need those places where you can break something or take something that's a tool that's not usually used in this context and, and use it. You know, there was one time where uh, I was doing a, a painting, an acrylic painting, and I decided, you know, I don't want to just use my usual brushes or the usual go-to things. And I went outside and I found a stick in the yard. And I said, you know what, I'm going to just take this, I'm going to dip this in paint, and I'm going to like scratch this across the surface and see what happens. And if it looks horrible, okay, so be it. Then I can just paint over it or right, just use the canvas. Exactly. You know, it's not a big deal. But if I learn something from it, and then start to incorporate it and go, okay, well, obviously, I'm, maybe I'm not gonna do a whole painting with a stick, but maybe there's some element that gives me a texture. And I know now I can have that as part of my toolbox that if I want that texture, I pull out that stick and I use that. Or maybe it gives me an idea for something else. So it was a jumping point. It wasn't necessarily that, hey, I'm gonna use this stick from now on in my paintings, but it spurred another idea. And so I think we have to keep figuring out how to introduce that into our work and into our creativity and to push things, to break things, to reverse engineer things, to experiment like the mad scientist. What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And, and quiet the fear that says, this is going to look stupid. You're going to look stupid. It's not going to work. It's going to be a waste of time, resources, material, whatever. When we can silence that voice and just, dive into play like a little kid that's when some magical things can happen and you just helped me connect a couple of different things one is i i firmly believe that the uh living one day at a time isn't just a concept in recovery as i've helped uh leaders get into professional development emotional intelligence kind of any of the a lot of the skills that i teach it is about waking up in the morning and realizing you can't go on automatic pilot you've got to choose the day and make it work. And part of that is that's a daily habit. And that's so when you get up and you want to be present and kind as you do great things, you have to choose it in the morning. You have to choose it each day when you when you get up. And that to me is like that when you're talking about your daily habit. And it if you are afraid, you'll be passive. And yeah. you'll be people oftentimes they have all the tools and yet they're waiting for that kick in the butt to move forward. They're 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 it's an external, extrinsic motivation, ex external. I'll wait till somebody pays me to do this. I'll wait until I get affirmation for something I haven't done yet. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, and if you, don't, if you don't have to make a living, you can wait to be inspired. You can wait for the muse. But if you, you want to make a dent in the world, if you want to support your family, if you want to challenge others, then you have to develop that habit. And this is the main connection you helped me make, is that when you get up every day and have to do it, if you don't play, you'll run out of stuff quick. Yeah. If you don't have that attitude of, of uh, sandboxing. Uh, I think it was, uh, oh, you, ever, you know the band OK Go? Mm -hmm. So they have that video of them. They got a couple of really strange videos. One with all the, like the treadmills. They have one where they compress a, a film so it, it goes all in like, like eight seconds and then they show all the, all the stuff in between. They've done some stuff in a, uh, the, the, uh, the NASA's plane that does the parabola so you get weightlessness. They're doing a TED talk about, you know, uh, you know, how do you make stuff? How do you create? And their thing was, no, we just, we find stuff. What mm -hmm. we do is we take some really cool things, and I think they called it sandboxing, and we just take some really cool things, and we put them together, and we see what happens. Yeah. I thought that was, that was, that was brilliant about – it's not like we, we don't, we're not producing things. We're finding things that are already out there waiting to be exploded. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. So I want to get into you. You have a course on, it's called the artist journey. Mm -hmm. I, I want to 
Tell me a little bit about why it's a journey. Yeah, well, it's a journey because it's ongoing. And people might find themselves in various points along their own journey as an artist, as a creator. They may be trying to figure out what they're passionate about. They may be trying to figure out what their voice is, what their style is. They may be wrestling with the inner critic uh, and fear. There may, you know, and there's so many facets to this. And it's not like, um, it's not like a video game where it's like, okay, I cleared level one and now I'm on level two and then I'll go to level three. You know, some of these things cycle back around because whenever you find yourself trying something new, that voice, that inner critic is there in your head messing with you. And so you may be a creative professional for years and years and years, and you start to do some new creative expression. You start to use some new medium um, or some new outlet and that voice comes back and is now messing with you again. And so these things, we need to keep talking about them. We need to keep figuring out how do we keep moving forward to create the art that we need to, to get out of us and send out into the world because other people need it right? Our art is not for us. It's really for other people. And so how do we walk and work in such a way that we're attempting to continually push that forward? And we have battles again with the inner critic. We have battles with trying to figure out, you know, passion and expression. And sometimes, honestly, I found also that it can be things like loneliness right? The creative process can be a lonely process because so many times people go away in the cave, right? And they're creating and they're making their thing. And and then they want to come out of the cave and then bring out their work and go here, I created it. It's here now come and buy it and, you know, marvel at it and whatever, hang it up on a wall. Um, But that process is very, very lonely because we're we're not engaging with anybody in that it's solo act and then in that solo act a lot of times we fall prey to thinking like hey i'm the only one who's experiencing this yeah i'm you know the um you 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 talk about the inner critic and how paralyzing that can be yes i heard uh safi bacall whose latest book is called loon shots out there and the book premise of the book is that every great uh uh movement in our culture has been failed three or four times before it actually changed the world. But in a couple different interviews, he talks about how when you hear that inner critic, when that voice starts to pull you back, we fight it. And what he talks about is make it your friend and understand. And the way that he reframes that critical voice is saying, all right, it's just trying to make sure you don't uh, make a fool of yourself. It's a protective voice. And when you engage that voice in conversation, you can really start to begin to understand your fears a little bit more rather than repress them. I thought it was such an interesting notion to not squelch your inner critic, but befriend it Mm. and almost do some uh, little uh, uh, emotional, motivational jujitsu by (laughs) saying, hey, uh, I'm going to leverage this energy that seems to be recurring and figure out, first of all, you give it air. And you say, tell me, what's, what, what are you afraid of for me? And once it gets aired, it tends to go away. He also talks about, uh, if you, like he was talking about this, this technique, if you have trouble, your mind racing before you go to sleep. He says, just you know, give each of those inner critics, those inner worries, a platform. Because they're trying to tell you something. Let them, let, it, let them tell you and then dismiss them. Hmm. I thought that was a really fascinating way to deal with that inner critic because I, I live that inner critic thing and the, the whole uh, imposter syndrome and all that. Yeah. But giving it air and befriending it seems to have some power for me. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that I found works best for me has been realizing that that's one, number one, it's not me. It is that inner critic who's making those thoughts come and sometimes those accusations and sometimes lies that I believe, right? So like I believe when I was younger that because I struggled with proportions and drawing and because I couldn't do photorealistic style that I wasn't a quote unquote real artist 
And therefore that's what made me really veer more into graphic design as opposed to illustration or fine art. And so for a really long time, I believe that, well, I just, I'm not really an illustrator. I'm not really an artist. Um, and I had to expose that and then come against it. And so for me, really the thing that helps me move past the inner critic is creating that habit that also creates a bias towards action because the critic can be going and running his mouth and I'm like, okay, you're telling me that I'm not going to produce anything good. It's not going to connect with anybody. I'm going to throw it out there and there's going to be crickets and so on and so forth. And I'm like, okay, okay. You're saying that you're saying that now, while you're saying that I'm going to come over here and I'm going to start to do something. And if it's to take out my materials, if it's to organize myself so that I have my ideas and I know what I'm going to start to do. And then while you're running your mouth, I'm going to start creating and I'm going to start doing some stuff. And then eventually the, the voice just kind of goes off to the background and I'm, I'm enveloped in the activity of creating. Yeah. And part of it is engaging that voice so that you, uh, you point out its logical fallacy. Yeah. You know, it, it, I don't know. It could be true that you can't draw your proportions, but the logical fallacy is, yeah, that doesn't mean that you can't connect. Right. And yep. you, you basically, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, we have this conversation. You're right about this. You're wrong about this. I'm going to move on. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to move into um, a little bit about, you know, you've had experience in the church and you've had experience in helping others move forward. I'm curious about what you think the role uh, art and creativity can play in, in growing people. How can we intentionally use art and creativity in, in professional development? Uh, I think that art is an expression of who we are and what's important to us. And, and I want to be careful to use the term, you know, art, um, because some people might automatically categorize themselves not as an artist or a creative person. But I think we're all creative. It may just come out in different ways. And some people are creative with numbers and systems. Some people are creative, you know, if they get in trouble, they're going to get real creative. <laughs> we'll figure out how to get out of it. Um, you know, and some other people, it's more of, of an actual piece of art. Um, other people, maybe it's content creation, right? Entrepreneurs or people who are wanting to be coaches or business leaders and they're, they have material and they're creating that uh, videos and blog posts and so on and so forth. So I think there's, there's something in all of us that we have to create and to give. And I think it's important that we exercise that because even if it's, if it's in um, just in a personal way, not in a professional way, I think it's important to have a place that you get to express that you get to lean into that and leverage that feeling of creating something and giving it away to somebody and having their life be impacted. Because again, then you're reminded that there's a much bigger story going on. It's not just about you and you haven't been given these things to hoard them or to use them just for your own purposes, but really figure out how can I use this stuff to impact somebody else's life. And the more that we can lean into that, I think the more satisfied and we'll feel, the more significance we'll feel to our work and, um, and get to understand how do we do it in such a way that our fingerprints are on it, um, that it's, it's coming uniquely through us. It, and it may be, yes, I may be painting and there may be you know thousands and millions of painters, but I, the, the, as it comes through me, it's going to look and feel a certain way and I'm going to have my lenses that I lend to it. And so when this thing is created, it's, it's coming through my personhood, you know? So, and this is what I heard in there and correct me if I'm wrong, but number one, I love the fact that you are dispelling the myth that people aren't creative. The, the fact is we are born creative and we unlearn it starting about the age at age five we unlearn our, cre our creativity and our, those competencies around creativity. And I think it's important to help people. If I'm, if I'm coaching somebody, if I'm working with a business or business leader, to help them understand that you are not uh, captured uh, in, the, in the world of, of 
straightforward, logical thinking, you're allowed to think laterally and you have those skills. Um, I think that's freedom right there. It opens up a lot of uh, growth potential. The other thing I heard you, you talk about was um, that it's okay to put your own fingerprints on the work that you do. As a matter of fact, as soon as, even if you're working for a big company, if you're in a corporation or whatever, um, you can get stuff done, but creativity and uh, the artisan part, the builder part, uh, helps get the right stuff done because you're thinking differently about the problems and situations that, you're, that, that arise. Does that jive with what you're thinking? Yes. Uh, and I will say that there are certain times in which if creativity is your profession, you know, you're working for somebody else, uh, you have a client, you have committees, you have other people who are speaking into your creative, uh, you know, expression, it becomes more difficult sometimes to um, do that in a way that you feel is true is a true expression of what it is that you're trying to say and do. Um, and, you know, it, like for me, a lot of the graphic design work that I've done in the past and continue to do, there's a client, right? There's, I'm doing art that's for somebody else. It's somebody else, uh, somebody else's logo, somebody else's company, somebody else's message. And, and that's what they're paying me for to bring my visual sensibilities and my design and my communication skills to help them with their problem, help solve their problem. Now that's not necessarily an area where I'm gonna interject my personal feelings on a you know, specific subject. That's not the right forum for that. Um, but I will say that we do need those forums. So there are things that I talk about in terms of passion projects. And a lot of people get tripped up with this, especially if they're in a creative day job, you know, all day long they're creating for somebody else, right? And so, the last thing they want to do is come home and they don't feel like they have anything left in their tank to then do for their own personal projects. But the problem is when we don't pursue that, when we don't push into that, we don't have an outlet for those projects and for those, for that art that we want to create. And so we start to have increased frustration with our day job and our creative jobs that we're getting paid for. And we don't have that personal expression and we are in this cycle that we just can't seem to break out of. And so I say, you know what? We need to find a way to figure out how do we carve out time for those personal passion projects because they will a lot of times inform our other work as well. Well, and you've talked about that, how your, your daily uh, habit or ritual of, of producing has also you know, kind of filtered into your work for others. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's almost like it's counterintuitive that by by you working all day creating, going home and creating for yourself doesn't take away from your tank. It adds to it. Right. And and it's just getting over that that myth and um, figuring out how to reallocate some energy sometimes towards that, because we're often led by the feeling of being depleted. And the feeling of, oh, I've just been giving all day long. And, you know, how, how can I do that now for me, you know? So, the, and related to this, because I, I work in the world of, of professional organizational development and how things, how people learn and grow, how communities are formed. But um, part of that transfers over to your direct experience. You've worked at churches uh, as for, in graphic arts, and now you attend churches as an artist and creator. Um, What's it like for artists and creatives, not in the church staff, but for artists and creatives who are attending churches? What's it like for them? I think it obviously depends on your experience, uh, the church that you belong to, and how open they are to the arts. I, I you know, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to critique the church too harshly, but I think there's a lot of room to grow in terms of figuring out how to utilize artists better. Because many times I think if they are being used, it's more for just a sermon illustration or some support to uh, the, the overall message. And again, you know, there's, there's that line, right? You know, 
it's not that the artist is going to come in and say, Hey, this is my personal project and this is my message that I want to broadcast. And, and, you know, sometimes that's not the right uh, avenue for it. But on the other hand, I don't, I don't think it can just be relegated to this is the packaging for a, a sermon series or for a particular outreach or whatever it looks like um, in terms of the programming of the church. Um, I think there needs to be some kind of acknowledgement that, that the community aspect needs to be there more because many times you can be going to a church, especially larger churches, where you're surrounded by other artists, but you don't even know it. And if you could start to harness the power of that for, as a community so that the artists can say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm a believer and I create art and I have these specific struggles that are specific to our category that other artists, you know, down the street don't because they don't go to church. They don't believe. Um, and so can we talk about some of those things? Can we wrestle through some of those things? Um, as well as encourage each other in fostering a community where there's critiquing of work and idea exchange, um, those kind of things. So on a community level, I think there could be a lot more that could be done to acknowledge the need for that. And then I think as things started to rise up out of that community, there might be opportunity for the church to step in to be like, Hey, we want to come alongside of, and maybe it's not necessarily for a Sunday morning program element, but maybe there's something else. Maybe there's an outreach aspect where trust is built between the church leadership and the artists. And there's some uh, ability given to the artists to become leaders, because I think that's really where it gets a little tricky, right? Because Sometimes artists are the weirdos, right? You know, they're the flaky ones. They're the ones that are, I don't know what they're going to do. This is a little dangerous. What if they make something that's just kind of scary or something that's really out there? And, you know, what if people don't get it? I mean, my grandma's here in church and she's like, what is this? You know, um, so I, and I get that. And I think we, we need to address that, but come to a place where, maybe there's not so much suspicion or prejudgment um, and figuring out, okay, how can we effectively come together and how can the church come alongside of artists and say, yes, be leaders, be equipped and be uh, commissioned to do the thing that you are meant to do in the way that you're meant to do it. Amazing. Not necessarily a heavy, a heavy handed this is our program. Can you fit it into this and shoehorn it into, you know, again, be an illustration or something. So you reminded me of Brennan Manning uh, has a chapter in one of his books called Pioneer Theology. And he explains the Holy Spirit in Pioneer Theology as the buffalo hunter who provides meat for the, for the, for the people and rides through every once in a while and just scares the hell out of everybody. <laughs> and it, it reminded me, man, you know what? You know who the first population to experience the Holy Spirit was? It was the artists and the creators when they were building uh, the tabernacle. Yeah. In the Old Testament, capital S, Holy Spirit. Uh, so maybe what you just hit on is that, you know what? The, the artists and the creatives, these weirdos, might be the, the channel for the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways. And it's scary. Yeah. Um, the other picture that comes to mind is uh, I sometimes feel by not engaging and inviting the artists into the church community. Um, and I felt this in other contexts where I, I fully find my identity in Christ, but man, I found better community in my, in this case, it was outdoor people, but I know some of my artist friends feel community with their artist group and less so in the church because they're not acknowledging their giftedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, when you talk about the image of the church as a body and we're missing our right leg because we're not engaging the artists. Yeah. And I will say this, that, you know, I'm talking in generalizations here, right? Yeah. There are some churches out there that, that do have arts 
ministries and, and artist communities that are doing some great things. One off the top of my head that I can think of is Saddleback. Um, you know, Saddleback Church, they have a specific arts uh, group that meets and they create art, um, you know, for themselves and for projects for the church and for the community. And uh, from what I've seen just via social media and kind of, you know, secondhand, um, I think they're doing a phenomenal job at creating that community and having uh, coming around, um, you know, causes and, and a purpose um, and still being true to themselves. Yeah. And, and that's, I wanted to get into how can the church be more welcoming? I, I know of another church that has a songwriters group and they get together and they, they perform for each other. They, they workshop their, their, their stuff. And it turns into a great kind of, here's a place where people can enjoy music, but also work on their craft. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else can the church, what else can these groups do to help invite the creatives in? Uh, you know, if it's a place where there's even, um, you know, a, a physical space that can be lent to the artist to say, Hey, you know, if it's once a month, once a week, whenever it is, once a quarter, open up the space and say, Hey, we're going to let the artists come in. You know, we'll put down some drop cloths. We'll make sure that the places, <laughs> you know, get wrecked. Um, but you know, create a space where artists can come in for one night and just have a kind of co-creation space uh, where you can hang out, put on some music and learn from each other, you know, Oh, like look over the shoulder and say, you know, I noticed you're painting this certain way. You know, can you tell me about that? Like, why are you doing that? Or how do you do that? Or, you know, allowing some just connection time as well as creation time. Uh, that's one thing I can think of. Another is um, even some of the, the wall space within the church um, you know, some churches have a lot of wall space and they don't necessarily utilize it well, or they're putting up things that are just, you know, kind of boring or dated or, you know, whatever it is, it's it just, it could be utilized in such a better way. If we invited artists to say, maybe we'll have a gallery that rotates. Maybe we'll have a theme. Grace. Yeah. What does grace mean to you? Now go create something. And for this next month, we're going to install it and put it up in the church. And so as people are walking in and out of the building and going to various things in the building, you know, we can see this work and it can reinforce some of the things and, 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 and engage with people on a, in a different way than just maybe a spoken word or a song or something else. Maybe there's the visual aspect, you know what I mean? Or maybe there's a community, um, you know, event that the church can kind of partner with to say, Hey, you know, um, we see that you're having this arts festival. We would love to come and, you know, help in some way, serve in some way, um, you know, make inroads with a lot of the people. And, and I'll be honest with you, like, right. So we talk about the weirdo artists and stuff, right. And, and typically a lot of the arts, you have more, um, experimentation, you have more, uh, you know, more of the maybe liberal leaning as opposed to conservative. And so there's that scary part for some people in leadership, right? They're like, well, you know, I don't know, we were on different sides of this or that, whatever, you know, if we can start to figure out how do we build bridges instead of building up, you know, our forts and, and figuring out, okay, well, we're here, you know, they're there and we're here and we just don't mix. How can we build the bridges and then start to have some conversations and, have some of those opportunities flow naturally from those conversations. That would be, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to tag my friend, Alan Hilton, who started a house United, which is trying to heal those divides. It'd be interesting because I know that like, uh, I've got a friend who is uh, big into helping uh, comedians get successful, but Christian comedians feel ostracized in the entertainment industry. If they're, if they're conservative, mm, yeah. um, I would imagine that they're conservative artists feel a little bit of uh, angst stepping into uh, a, a field that's primarily uh, left-leaning. But what if we, you know, we want people to come to church on our home turf. What if we tried to engage uh, both sides in this medium uh, where it's common ground mm -hmm. and you can connect over the art and all of a sudden that, those divides start to come together. Mm -hmm. um, people find common ground in order to to work forward. I I I think that uh, 
Alan's book it talks about how the church can save the world through this House United. I think you're onto something here, which is how artists can save the world um, by bringing them together. Yeah, those are some great ideas. Hmm. Um, anything else that you could think of that would bring them all together? Um, One more crazy wild idea. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be an idea. I mean, those, those are the ones that readily came to mind. Again, underneath it all, I think it really boils down to relationship conversation. Because without that, you're just going to have programs, you're going to have events, you're going to have a lot of things on your calendar. But are they really going to make a difference at the end of the day? Not so much. It's really when you start focusing on the relationships, on the community aspect of fellow artists, on how the artists and the church in the church can partner together, as well as the church and the artists in the church partner with those outside the church, you know. Well, uh, just in this conversation, I I, th I thought of two artists in our church that would um, be amazing to approach about creating a makerspace in our in our facility at our place. Uh, and just you know, like you said, just like youth um, youth ministry back in the early '70s, where everybody's worried, oh, if we get all the kids together, they're going to ruin the <laughs> facility. I think you know it's the same sort of thing. There's this hesitance of what are the artists going to do the room? Well you can mitigate that, but just make it happen that the room is for the people, not the people for the room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've kept you on longer than I should have. And I really appreciate all this time that you spent exploring with me. Um, and I'm walking away with some tangible things that I can bring to my people. So awesome. Mike, thank you so much for this time. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely.